You are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio. Today on Pathway to Victory, Dr. Robert Jeffress continues his discussion on the gift of tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, the chapter about the gift of tongues. We've been looking in the first 20 verses at what Paul said about the gift of tongues. But beginning tonight, we're going to look at some practical application of that truth in our lives as well. Welcome to Pathway to Victory with author and pastor Dr. Robert Jeffress. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul provides a list of spiritual gifts that Christians are given in order to benefit the church. But are all these gifts still legitimate and relevant in our day? On today's edition of Pathway to Victory, Dr. Robert Jeffress takes a closer look at the gift of tongues. Now here's Dr. Jeffress with the next message in our series called Straight Answers to Tough Questions. That's right, David. Today on Pathway to Victory, we're continuing our series called Straight Answers to Tough Questions, Volume 2. But first, as an extension of our ministry to you, we're always on the lookout for helpful resources that provide straight answers to some of the tough questions you have about your faith. And today, I'm pleased to send you a very popular brochure called Christianity, Cults, and Religions. We've already given thousands of these away. This brochure folds out into ten colorful panels that give you a clear side-by-side comparison of 16 different religions with Christianity, religions like Scientology, Islam, Buddhism, and others. This brochure is my gift to you just for going online and requesting a copy at ptv.org. Again, the brochure is called Christianity cults, and religions. In addition, I'd like to come alongside you and help you sharpen your skills in personal Bible study and prayer. And so I've written a book that includes some simple instructions on the practical process I've learned over the years. My book is called Spiritual Essentials, How to Study the Bible, How to Pray. And when you give a generous gift to support the ministry of Pathway to Victory, I'll make sure to send a copy to your home. Well, I'll have more to say about these resources later, but right now, we're turning to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where the Apostle Paul gives explicit guidelines for speaking in tongues and prophesying. I've titled today's study, Chaos in the Church. A seminary professor I once had said, Doctrine without application is spiritual abortion. To teach God's Word and then never suggest how His Word applies in our life is to prematurely end a message. It is to abort what God wants to do in people's lives. And that's why every time in the Bible there is a major doctrine presented, it is always followed by application. You find that, for example, in the book of Romans. The first 11 chapters are very heavy in their doctrinal teachings. And and someday we'll do a verse-by-verse exposition of Romans. Heavy doctrine in the first 11 chapters. But in chapter 12, verse 1, Paul begins, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. The same principle is true in 1 Corinthians 14, the chapter about the gift of tongues. We've been looking in the first 20 verses is what Paul said about the gift of tongues. But beginning tonight, we're going to look at some practical application of that truth in our lives as well. I want you to open your Bible tonight, not to 1 Corinthians 14 yet, but to Acts chapter 2. And I want to remind us, uh, since it's been a while since we've been in 1 Corinthians 14, 
of exactly what we saw last time. Remember the church was dividing over any and every issue in Corinth, and one issue they divided over was spiritual gifts, especially the gift of tongues. And we said last time that the gift of tongues originally was the gift of languages. It is the ability to speak in a language you do not know in order that people can understand the gospel. And remember we talked about two of the purposes of tongues last time. We said, first of all, tongues was given for the communication of the gospel message. Write that down on your outline. For the communication of the gospel message. Remember the first time tongues was ever uh, exercised was at the day of Pentecost. Just a few weeks after Jesus Christ had died and ascended into heaven. And remember all of the Jews had gathered together in Jerusalem for the celebration of this feast. And so you had the feast of Pentecost. You had Jews of all different uh, areas who spoke different languages who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. What happened? Well, Peter stood before that crowd, that crowd who just weeks earlier had been responsible for crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ, and he spoke the gospel message to them. And look at verse 6 of Acts 2. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together, and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing the apostles speak in his own language. Now that was the miracle of the gift of tongues. Why was that so important? It's because God wanted to get the gospel message out as quickly as possible. You had all of these Jews here from different parts of the world hearing the gospel preached. They could hear it in their own language and when they went back home they could spread the gospel. No time for language school uh, at that point. The second purpose of tongues was the authentication of the gospel messengers. The authentication of the gospel messengers. 2 Corinthians 12, 12 says, The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. Now how did those Jews know that Peter was telling the truth? That God had instituted a new covenant, a new arrangement. Well, remember, at this point in history, there was no New Testament. So the way that God confirmed that Peter and the apostles were telling the truth is by their ability to perform signs and wonders and miracles, including the ability to speak in tongues. Now, let me add a third reason for the gift of tongues tonight, and that is the verification of gospel recipients. Turn over to Acts chapter 10 for just a moment. Remember, one of the reasons the Jews had such a hard time believing the gospel is the gospel allowed for Gentiles to be saved as well as for Jews. The gospel message, the mystery of the church, was that Gentiles, whom the Jews regarded as scum, as dogs, the gospel message said that Gentiles were fellow heirs to the kingdom of God. And the Jews had a hard time accepting that. And so when they heard word that the Gentiles were being saved as well, how did they know these Gentiles were accepted as a part of God's kingdom? Look at verses 45 and 46. All the circumcised believers, that is the Jews, who came with Peter were amazed because of the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. Well, how did they know the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles? Look at verse 46. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. The ability of these new Gentile converts to speak in languages they had not previously known was verification that they had truly received the gospel message and were a part of the body of Christ. Now, with that introduction, turn over to 1 Corinthians 14, and let's pick up our verse-by-verse study with verse 21. Remember, the purpose of tongues was communication, authentication, verification, but to whom was this sign, the gift of tongues, intended? Look at verse 21. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people... That is the Jews. And even so, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Now, Paul is quoting from Isaiah 28 to show that the gift of tongues was a sign for unbelievers. And in this Isaiah 28 passage, this was a prophecy given by God to Isaiah where Isaiah said to the southern kingdom of Israel, 
There is going to be a strange nation, the Babylonians, who are going to come and overtake our nation. They will speak in a language we do not recognize. And the coming of the Babylonians is a sign of God's judgment against us. When the Babylonians came, they didn't come speaking ecstatic gibberish. They came speaking a real language, even though it was unfamiliar to the unbelieving Jews. The point Paul is making is that the gift of tongues was certainly so that people could understand the gospel, but it was also a sign of God's coming judgment. Now, remember when the the day of Pentecost came in about 33 AD? This gift of tongues was also a sign to the Jewish people of God's coming judgment. Because in 70 AD, just about 37 years after this event, remember Titus, the Roman emperor, in fact, did come as an instrument of God's judgment against the Jews, and he destroyed Jerusalem. So Paul's point here is that tongues is a sign for unbelievers. Look at verse 22. So then tongues are for a sign, not for those who believe, but to unbelievers. But remember, he's contrasting tongues to a better gift, which is prophecy, the clear speaking of the word of God. But prophecy is a sign not to unbelievers, but for those who believe. In other words, prophecy is a better gift because it is in the church and it is meant for believers to build them up. Therefore, the emphasis in the church should be on prophecy, the speaking of God's word, not on tongues. But even though tongues were meant for unbelievers, here's the ironic thing, tongues can actually be a hindrance in evangelism to unbelievers. How could that be? Look at verse 23. Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and they all speak in tongues and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say, you're mad? Paul pictures this idea here of the church assembling together. All of these people at once start speaking in tongues, speaking this language, these languages, or the counterfeit gift of tongue we talked about last time, this ecstatic gibberish. Just suppose all that's going on at once and an unbeliever happens to come into the church. They didn't come very often to church. But suppose an unbeliever stumbled into church and heard all of this sound and confusion going on, he would think he'd come into an insane asylum. It'd be an immediate turnoff to him. Look at verse 24. However, in contrast, if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to an account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. If an unbeliever comes into a church and everybody is prophesying, speaking a word from God in an orderly fashion, that's going to speak to an unbeliever. He's going to hear God's word. He'll be convicted of his sin while he may fall on his face and worship God. Paul's point here is that although tongue serves three important purposes for unbelievers, tongues are still inferior to the gift of prophecy. Now, beginning in verse 26, Paul is going to talk about the practice of spiritual gifts in the church, specifically the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy. Look at verse 26. What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. First of all, in the earliest, earliest church meetings, uh, there were no professional ministers. Remember, 1 Corinthians was one of the earliest books of the New Testament written. And at this point in time, the church had just been birthed. The church was in transition from the time of the apostles until finally when you get to the latter epistles like Timothy and Thessalonians, there is order in the church. There's organization with pastors and deacons in the church. So here we're in that in-between time, and that means everyone participated in worship. There wasn't just a pastor who uh, preached or a minister of music who sang. Everyone participated. And secondly, there was no strict order of worship. 
Now we're going to see in just a moment, there's nothing wrong with having an order of worship. God wants things to be done orderly. But in the earliest church meetings, the church met on Sunday evenings. They uh, gathered together, 1 Corinthians 11 tells us, for a meal once a week. It was a sanctified potluck supper is what it was. Everybody brought their own dish to the, the, the supper. And they enjoyed koinonia, fellowship around the tables together. And then when they had finished their meal, there would be a time of sharing. Somebody might share a song. Somebody might share a word from the Old Testament. If somebody had the gift of prophecy, they might share a prophetic revelation. Again, remember, there was no New Testament written at this point. And then the evening would conclude with the observance of the Eucharist, what we call the Lord's Supper around the table. And that was the early church worship experience. Now, here's the guiding principle. Paul says, whatever is done in the church should be for edification. That word edification means to build up. Everything done in the church ought to be for edification. That is either evangelism or the strengthening of believers. Now, with that background... Paul says, here are some guidelines, first of all, for the gift of tongues. Look at verse 27. If anyone speaks in a tongue, here's the qualifications. It should be by two or three at the most, and each in turn, and one must interpret. Now notice those guidelines. If you're going to have the gift of tongues in the church, only two or three can do it. And this is a real language. There has to be an interpreter and notice it has to be in order, one after the other. Verse 28, But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. There always has to be an interpreter who gives an accurate interpretation. Now, here are the guidelines concerning prophecy. Now, Today, the gift of prophecy, and I believe Romans 12 teaches there is a gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy today is the motivation to speak God's word in such a way that it convicts people of sin. But in Paul's day, there was an actual office of the prophet, somebody who received new revelation from God to speak to the church. Again, remember, there was no New Testament at this point. Today, we have a New Testament. Everything we need to know from God is in this book. Jude verse 3 says, The faith has been once for all delivered to the saints. There's no new revelation about God being given today. It's all in this book. But in the New Testament, that wasn't true when the New Testament was being penned. And so there was an office of the prophet, somebody who could speak a word from God. So if that happened to be a gift, Paul gives some regulations about it. Verse 29, Let two or three prophets speak, and then let the others pass judgment. If somebody claimed a new revelation from God, it had to be tested by other people with the gift of discernment. And most often, it was compared to the Old Testament Scripture. Verse 30, but if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. That is, he's saying priority is to be given to new revelation rather than uh, older revelation. Verse 31, for you can all prophesy, and here it is again, one by one so that all may learn and so that all may be exhorted. Verse 33, why? For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. You know, there is this funny idea that if something is organized in the church, it's somehow unspiritual. That somehow God is honored by disorganization. Nothing could be further from the truth. God is a God of order, not one of confusion. There is nothing wrong with having things organized. And God says he is a God of order, not of confusion. Now, Paul has given us guidelines about the exercise of tongues. Also guidelines about the gift of prophecy. And now verse 34. <laughs> guidelines concerning women in the church in relationship to prophecy and tongues. Look at verse 34. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. 
Aren't you glad it's I who's up here tonight (laughs) trying to explain this and not you? Let me make a couple of uh, observations about Paul's words here. First of all, observation number one, in no way is Paul implying that women are inferior to men. You know, I have to say, those who are considered fundamental Christians, who believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, have been some of those most guilty for twisting the Bible into saying something it never says. And using the Bible to beat up on women or to give the idea that somehow women are second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I want to be very careful as I go through this passage to give honor to women the very same honor that Scripture gives to women, that Jesus gives to women, that the Apostle Paul gives to women. Why, by even addressing women as he does in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul was elevating women to a position uh, the culture, the Roman culture, the Jewish culture, did not give them at all. By saying, women, you have rights in the home and you have responsibilities in home. That was unheard of. Uh, In the Roman culture, the Jewish culture, women were nothing but property. It's the Bible that elevates women. Years ago, I read a book by former President Nixon in the arena, and one sentence caught my attention. He said, the Bible is a wellspring of truths, but it contains one falsehood, that women are the weaker sex. We're sorry, Mr. President, you're both dead and wrong. You're dead wrong, okay? Okay. The Bible doesn't teach that. It doesn't teach that women are weaker, are inferior. The second point I would make here about these verses is the context of Paul's teaching here is the worship service of the church. When he talks about women being quiet in the church, he's not saying, ladies, when you come to church, you're supposed to be like the Amish, you know, you become quiet and don't let a word slip from your mouth until you leave the doors. That's not what he's talking about. The word not speak has reference to specifically prophesying or the gift of tongues. That's what he's talking about here. That women are not to engage in giving a prophetic word from God or speaking in tongues, which like other scriptures means women cannot serve as pastors. If a woman is not to speak in the assembled church, if she is not to give a prophetic word from God, then that means obviously she cannot be a pastor. You are listening to Second Chance Ministry Radio.